how many people are sleeping? <laughs> Before I counted, 23. It's a bit better, yeah. All right, good. How many people have a background in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Some knowledge about, yeah? Okay. All right. Hopefully after today you'll have a bit more. All right. So obviously, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Greg Meta. It's a little bit difficult to pronounce in Spanish, I know. Just think, Gregorio? Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, I was born in South Africa, but I grew up in Australia and Israel. So I come from three countries, and two of them are famous for conflict, and the other one is famous for kangaroos, <laughs> obviously. And for some reason, I seem to follow the conflict and not the kangaroos. <laughs> so I'm in Colombia. Over the last 10 years, I've traveled to about 90 countries, including Colombia for the first time in 2008. And like many foreigners, I fell in love with your country and decided to return. Four years ago, I was in Israel completing my master's degree in conflict resolution. And I could see that the peace process in Colombia was moving in the right direction. So I decided to come back to Colombia and work and teach, contribute within the peace process and learn Spanish. Okay. Today I'm going to introduce you to a lot of ideas related to conflict resolution. A lot of different ideas. And I'm going to use the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to explain a lot of these ideas and yeah, as, as a comparison also to the conflict in Colombia. Now, these ideas are very complex and very detailed and we don't have time today to talk about all the details of all these ideas, so it's a little bit fast and it's a little bit like an introduction to a lot of these ideas. If it's interesting and it's valuable, I hope next semester we can meet again, maybe for some more time. Okay? Yeah. We talked about this. Okay. <clears throat> so there are two objectives. Oh, okay. There are two objectives of this presentation. The first is to give you a broader understanding of the nature of conflict resolution. And the second, I hope, is that after today, when you see how complicated the Israelis and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, you will have more optimism about the conflict in Colombia. Okay. Now, in terms of conflict resolution, what I want to introduce you to is the idea that there is three levels of conflict resolution, or we need to focus on three levels. You have the interests, the individual, and the society. It's very common during a peace process for a government or for the parties in a conflict to only consider and only focus on the first level, which is the interests. What I mean to say is all of the focus is on creating an agreement, sitting down, talking about the issues, making an agreement. Now this is a mistake from the perspective of, of conflict resolution. Why? Because conflicts are made up of people and societies, not just interests and an agreement. People create conflict and people need to solve conflict. So, in my opinion, it's, it's a mistake what most 
what usually happens during a peace process. And I'm not an expert on the conflict in Colombia, but from what I have seen, I do believe this, this has happened in Colombia too. A lot of attention on agreement, not a lot of attention on the people, the emotions, and the society. And we're going to talk about more of this now. So, let's begin with the interests. And I hope you noticed the slides are in Spanish to help you. It took me a lot longer. So, we're going to talk about the interests. And the interests are basically what you resolve through negotiation, through mediation, sit down, make an agreement. And in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we're going to talk about four main interests that need to be resolved to have an agreement. Okay, and you can see the four interests are the borders, security, Jerusalem, and refugees. Okay. We're going to begin with the borders. So, the first issue that needs to be resolved to have an agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians is borders. We need to have borders that define two countries. And can you see this map? Yeah? Can you see the... Hang on, I can help you. This red symbol in the middle, this is where Israel is located. Above Egypt, below Turkey. Yep? Can you see these maps more or less? At least the colours? Sleeping. <laughs> Sleeping. These are two maps of the same territory. Okay? The map on the left is in 1948, the year 1948. The map on the right is after 1967. Okay? Now, this first area here, this yellow area, this is Gaza. I'm sure you've heard Gaza. Okay? This area is a Palestinian territory, and the government is Hamas. All right. All of this white area, not here, but the rest of the white, this is Israel, basically. And the other larger yellow area is the West Bank. It's also a Palestinian territory. So there are two Palestinian territories. But the West Bank has a different government, the Palestinian Authority. Following me, you have one territory, Hamas. Israel, another territory, Palestinian Authority. So you really have three governments, okay? Now, this is very similar, but if you can see, there is a little bit more white. And a little bit more white. And this means that after 1967, Israel occupied more land, or took more land. The terminology is debatable amongst the sides, what words they use. But basically what's important is Israel has control of this area and a little bit more area. Now, to resolve this issue, from the Palestinian point of view, or I should say from the Palestinian authorities' point of view, they demand a country that is the entire area of this yellow and this yellow. That's what they say they need to, to make peace. Hamas doesn't agree. They don't want to make peace. They don't want to negotiate. They want all the land. So the two Palestinian governments have different negotiating positions. Okay. Now, the problem is, on this map, it's very difficult to create a border that looks like this, because now the border looks like this. So, what needs to happen is, there are, have you heard the, the term settlements? Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. 
but Israeli settlements. Okay, so after 1967, Israel built settlements, which are on this side of the West Bank border, here, here, here. So now what, why this is difficult is because to make that the border, it's a little bit too late because there is too many people living here. So the border needs to change, uh, which the Palestinians don't accept. So what will happen eventually is the border will come a little bit more this way, and what will happen is land swaps, which means rather than that being the border, this will be the border with some more yellow over here. They're going to swap land, basically. I hope that makes sense. Okay. That's the first issue. Now, the second issue is security. Okay. From the Israeli point of view, any agreement is a potential existential threat. This means that any agreement has the potential to destroy the country because of the size of the country. An agreement with the wrong terms can be the end of the country. That's from the Israeli point of view. The reason is because of the distance between the West Bank border which will be Palestine, and the most important places in Israel. Capital city, I should use this. Can you see this? Yep. Capital city, international airport, Tel Aviv, which is the cultural, the cultural capital. The distance between these three sites and the future border of Palestine is between 2 kilometers for Jerusalem, 10 kilometers for the airport, and 20 kilometers for Tel Aviv. That means that the future Palestinian state will have their border 2 kilometers from the capital of Israel. It's almost, it's unheard of, it doesn't happen in history, that you can have a capital city 2 kilometers from an enemy because they can take your capital in one day and your international airport 10 kilometers from the border, this means that if Palestine is not stable, if it has extremist groups that still want to attack Israel, they can come to the border and it's 10 kilometers to shoot down planes. Children can do this with rockets they make at home. This is why the issue of security is very difficult. Because right now, the Israeli military is in this area. It's, it's in the West Bank. So they can prevent this. In the future, with an agreement, they will have to leave the West Bank. So the Israeli military will be behind this line. They have no control what happens two kilometers over the border. Just like Venezuela has no control what happens two kilometers over the border into Colombia. So, for Israel to sign an agreement, they have to be guaranteed that the West Bank is safe, stable. There's no, there's no extremist groups. That whatever groups live in the West Bank, whatever Palestinian groups, have accepted the peace agreement. That's not just signed by the leadership, but then you have factions, different groups, that still want to attack. Because if that's the case, it's the end of Israel. Five, two kilometers, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers to the most important sites. In two days, they can attack and the country's, the country's finished. So this is very problematic because of the small distance between the future border and the Israeli cities and airport. So, in order to resolve this, what the Israelis want, this is their position. They want control over this area. Can you see that? Yes. Someone at the back? Yes. 
Yep, thank you. <laughs> they want control over this area, which is basically the border between the future Palestine and Jordan. It's called the Jordan Valley. Right now, they control this area. Israel controls this area. So they can prevent massive refugees from coming in from Syria, from Iraq. They can, present, they can prevent weapon smuggling. Basically, they control who comes in to this territory. They want to keep that control in the future, after the agreement. Just so they, basically, they want to control Palestine's border. Which doesn't really happen in history. Another country controlling another country's border. But because of the risk, that's how it is. Palestinians do not accept this, obviously. They don't accept that Israel can control their border. So this needs to be resolved with international peacekeepers. There are many different ways to, to resolve this issue, but it's complicated to guarantee the security. It needs to be negotiated. All right. Number three, Jerusalem. I'm sure you've heard of this city. Jerusalem is a sacred city to all three monotheistic religions, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. It's also the most important city to the Israelis and the Palestinians. And both the Israelis and the Palestinians believe that Jerusalem is their capital. That's how it is now. In fact, the Palestinians don't call Jerusalem, Jerusalem. They call it Al-Quds. It has a different name. So, both sides believe that Jerusalem was promised to them from God. Because in the Bible, in the Quran, it says basically that. That this city is a holy city and God gave it to the Jews, God gave it to the Muslims. So, there really is no way to negotiate Jerusalem logically, obviously. Uh, okay. It also has the most important sites for Jews and some of the most important sites for Muslims in the world. Uh, this is an example. This is the Temple Mount. This is oh, uh, a sacred site for Jews. And this is the Western Wall, which is the most sacred, most important place in the world for the Jewish tradition, both in Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, the same is for the Muslims, Palestinians, but also the Muslim world, not just Palestinians. This is the, oh, sorry, this has a mind of its own. It's you. <laughs> sorry. This is one of the most important sites in the world for Muslims. The Al-Aqsa Mosque, also one of the most important sites in the world for Muslims. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all of these sites are in Jerusalem. Now, there's two options with what to do with Jerusalem to resolve this issue. <clears throat> one is to share the city as a capital city in the future. One city working as the capital city of two countries. It's not gonna happen. Basically because the two sides do not have the type of relationship that will allow them to share a city. Uh, that means that people from another country can cross into your capital city because it's their capital city. It's one option, but it's, it's never gonna happen. The second option is to divide the city. This is very difficult, but more possible than the first option. So you can see here the blue, the blue area is Israeli 
neighborhoods in Jerusalem. So this is a map of Jerusalem, the shape. The blue is Israeli neighborhoods. The green is Palestinian neighborhoods. So because of this map, it's actually possible to divide the city without causing too much drama because it's already divided between neighborhoods. So that's quite possible. Okay. Now, it's very small, but there is a small area here, this black box. This is the old city. This is the old part of Jerusalem. This is where it becomes very difficult. All right. This is the old city. This has all of the most important sites that we just talked about. So this is, no exaggeration, the most important place in the world for Jews, and technically the third most important place in the world for Muslims after Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia. And it's a very small area. So when we talk about dividing Jerusalem, what we're really talking about is how to divide this. And no one has come up with a good solution yet because it's very dense and to divide this would mean putting borders, security checkpoints, incredibly complicated. This will probably be the last thing that they can resolve in the entire peace process. This will be the final thing because it is the hardest. Okay, the last issue, refugees. After the 1948 war, which was the independence war, when Israel was created, there were hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees as a result. And today, there are, according to the Palestinians, there are five million refugees because the refugees have had children, grandchildren, and sometimes great-grandchildren. It's been 70 years. So the two sides, Israel and the Palestinians, do not agree on who is to blame, whose fault for these refugees. From the Palestinian point of view, it was the Israeli military, Israeli aggression. But from the Israeli point of view, the Arab countries invaded Israel and Israel defended itself and as a result, this is what happened. So they don't agree on who is, who is to blame. They also don't agree on how many refugees because, like I said, the Palestinians believe there are 5 million refugees because of all of the descendants. But the only reason there are 5 million refugees is because all of the Arab countries around Israel and Palestine have never accepted Palestinian refugees. So you have hundreds of thousands of Palestinians living in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan is an exception, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. None of these countries for 70 years have given citizenship to Palestinian refugees. So there are people who have had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren who are all refugees living in an Arab country. This is very exceptional in history. It doesn't happen. So they don't agree with the number of refugees. Israel believes that there are only so many refugees because the Arab countries have refused to give them citizenship. And there is a lot of truth in this, in this claim. The good news is that this issue is actually the easiest to resolve in the agreement because the Palestinian leaders have accepted that the refugees are not going back to Israel. 